Lord God, thank you for being here. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for the words that you have prepared for us. Um, they're not mine, because uh, if they're mine, nothing's going to happen here. It's got to be you, your words, your truth, but our Jesus. In his name, amen. Okay, we started a new series last week. It's called First Faith, Then Freedom. And we named it that on purpose because Bob Christopher did a series a little bit more than a year ago called First Life, Then Change. Uh, change is not possible unless there's life. Change is not possible if faith isn't involved. And if you expect to try to change and get freedom without faith, you're going to be in a very bad place. I know because I've been there. If you need to know how bad it can be, come talk to me afterwards. But when James was talking about double-minded people, unstable in all ways, he was writing about me. For the longest time, I thought James shouldn't be in the New Testament, you know, because he was pointing fingers at me. And that... But trying to change without faith, trying to find freedom without faith is like trying to find life without Jesus. Okay. And so I asked this question last week, I'll ask it this week, and we'll ask it every week. Define faith. What is faith? If you don't have it memorized, where do you find it? Where do you find the answer to this question? Hebrews what? 11.1. What does Hebrews 11.1 say? One, two, three. That's because you all have different versions, right? <laughs> Here's the NIV version of it. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Can I hear an amen? amen. What's the next question? So what? <laughs> right? This is, this is hard. On the one hand, faith is hard because it's intangible. It's all about stuff we can't see and things we hope for. And so we tend to replace the intangible with the tangible. I can trust this lectern in that chair, so I will. Because I can see these. I can handle them. I can move them. I can control them. I can imagine them. Even when I'm not, you know, sitting in the chair, I know what the chair looks like. But that's not faith. Faith is intangible. In fact, faith is not intangible, but, you know, who we have faith in, we, we don't see. Our hope, we don't see. On the other hand, many of us, and I was in this place too for a while, we take far too low a view of faith. Faith might be good for those weak people, those lesser mortals, but faith isn't much good for me. Because I can do the things that I want to do. Besides, God hasn't talked to me in days and days and days, so what does he care? Right? Isn't that the temptation? You're going along well, and then you run into a wall of some kind, and you cry out to God, and you're met with silence. And the first thing Satan does is to suggest, see, I told you he didn't care. You are on your own. Now that's because we really don't understand faith. We don't, we, don't, we don't look at it other than in human terms. I mean, one could say both of these statements are as true about God as they are about faith because faith starts with God. We have so much trouble relating to God because we can't see him, we can't touch him, we can't control him. There's the rub. We want control. God won't be controlled. And we can't control things with faith. We can only rely on God. Okay? So last week, we took a look at faith in the Old Testament. I called it faith commanded. Why did I call it faith commanded? Because God commands us to believe in him. That's all the Israelites had to go on, was God's command. Right? 
Faith in the Old Testament was the response by humans, and in particular the children of Israel, to God's initiative. There's no better place for finding God's initiative and his command to believe than in the Old Covenant. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. That's me. I did that for you. You can never have done that for yourself. Therefore, you will have no other gods before me and on through the law. Of course they failed that. We do too. But that was God initiating to the children of Israel and saying, I'm going to make up a nation out of you that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'm going to bring the Messiah through you. I'm going to do that regardless of how faithful or unfaithful you are. And so we went through a bunch of examples in the book of Isaiah to show just how much God wanted the people to believe in his promises. And every example we showed last week had something to do with a messianic prophecy. Even the negative examples, right? King wouldn't ask for a sign. Oh, no, I'm not going to take a sign. I, I'll trust my political thing. And God says, I will show you a sign. A virgin will conceive. You, you know, it just stops you right in your tracks. Did he know what was going on? Probably not. Do we know what was going on? Yes, because Jesus has come. But imagine being the king and you're you know, being attacked and God has said, pay no attention to those smoldering sticks. I'll, I'll take care of them for you. And a virgin will conceive and bear a, a son. What does that have to do with the attack? God says, I am God. I initiate me Messiah to you. Believe me. Believe me. That's what God was saying. Believe me. But God he says, no. I am the Lord your God. I am going to bring this to pass. And as we find out today, he did. Okay? But the conclusion from last week was this. On the one hand, we tend to look to ourselves or external factors for strength. Therefore, we assume we can do it for and by ourselves. Israel did that every day of their lives. They couldn't get away from that for some reason. Every chance they got, they were trying to take care of things on their own. And then on the other side, things go badly. And we feel that God has abandoned us. Therefore, we assume that we must do it for and by ourselves. God told us not to make treaties with all these nations around and to marry their, their people, to import their paganism. Well, we figured we had it, had it under control, so we did anyway. And then it goes badly. And God lets us reap what we've sown and because we're reaping what we've sown, we go, oh, God's left us alone. And when you're reaping what you sow politically, you have to make more political concessions. So we must take care of ourselves. Therefore, we will make more treaties and marry more of these women and bring in more of their religion. And when you've got these two things working against each other, you are in a downward spiral that is just going to hurt when you hit bottom really is. Okay? So, that was the Old Testament. Lots of faith, lots of definition, lots of opportunity for faith in the Old Testament. But they never saw Messiah. So now what happens? Faith revealed. Something is going to change. But not everything is going to change. Something important is going to change. First, I've got to give you a bit of history. I hope to do this in just a couple of minutes because it's so easy to get lost in this. After the, the exile, when Judah finally came back, after the Babylonian exile, you remember Ezra and Nehemiah, at certain times by themselves and certain times together, 
brought the people back and rebuilt the wall and rebuilt some semblance of the temple so they could reinstitute the worship of the one true God. And, and everything they did in order to reinstitute the worship quite properly went back to the Mosaic Covenant. And if you read in, in Ezra, Nehemiah, um, Haggai, um, Zechariah, even Malachi, um, those people were writing about that time period. So they come home and they're trying desperately to not make the same mistake uh, again. They had hundreds of years of examples of doing it wrong. We don't want to do it wrong again. And so what happened is they began a love affair with the law. Right? Fast forward a couple of hundred years and the Greeks are are pounding on that part of the land. And, and they've come in and they've taken over the Jerusalem and the temple and Antiochus Epiphany has the gall to offer a pig on the altar. And the Maccabees um, family said enough is enough. And they inspired the people and rose up and threw the Greeks out of Jerusalem and began to rule. Again, they go back to the law. And what happened is that the Sadducees became a very powerful part of Israeli life. The Sadducees were, were the elite. They were actually all descendants of Levi. They were the priests. Therefore, it was their job to minister at the temple and to teach the people about the law. And they took full advantage of this. And the people responded. And they went from being what was supposed to be the religious leaders for the people to being both the religious and the political leaders of the people. They were very literal in their interpretation of the law. If it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, dog on it, we're going to poke your eye out or take your, your teeth or your hands or whatever if you mess up. If we catch you in adultery, you're going to be stoned right here. We'll call all the people together and stone you right outside your house. This part of, of the Sadducees' point of view didn't go real well with the people. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And so the Pharisees got started. Now, the Pharisees were much more progressive, honestly. Um, they, they took a, a wider view of things like the ownership of property so that women could inherit property in certain cases when there were no male heirs. Sadducees would never allow that. And, and they loved the law, but they weren't so literal about it. And so they would start interpreting it. And as they interpreted, they would add more to it. And they would add more to it. And they ended up just as strict as the Sadducees, but for completely different reasons. Because they had books and books and books of this stuff. The Sadducees only had the law and were looking for eyes to poke out. But you couldn't keep these laws any more than you could keep that law. And then they became political. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees were constantly fighting each other. And somewhere, I think it was around 100 B.C., they really had it out in the streets of Jerusalem. And the Pharisees nearly wiped out the Sadducees, just killed them in the streets and kind of took over. And the people, you know, got over it, and they figured it was okay. And, and then, the, you know, they didn't kill them all, so the Sadducees started growing again, because they, they are the keepers of the law. They are the Levites. And by the time Jesus enters the picture, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are still back at it politically. And the Sadducees were in charge politically, because they were smart enough to make a treaty with the Romans when the Romans came in that the Pharisees wouldn't make. Okay. And the only thing anybody knows about the Sadducees is what? They don't believe in a resurrection because that resurrection isn't mentioned in the law because they take the law literally, there's no resurrection. Let's not even talk about it. Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in a resurrection. Remember when Paul used that to his advantage? You know, he's standing before the Sanhedrin, and, and it's, you know, the Sadducees over here and the Pharisees over here, and he says, you know, the only reason I'm here is because I believe in the resurrection. Wow, he's one of us! 
You know, and they start fighting amongst themselves, and it's end of end of conversation. Well, that was the Sadducees and Pharisees. Both of them take different views of the Word of God. One is very literal, very limited. The other is more expansive and, and adds tradition to things in their own interpretation. Uh, the other, you know. But there was a third group called the Essenes. These people pulled away from everyone because they saw the political mess that the Pharisees and Sadducees got into and said, that's not what we're supposed to be about. We need to be separated from that kind of worldliness, and we will be off by ourselves and we'll be truly holy. You might not be surprised to learn that most of the, the zealots, the people who were constantly harassing the Romans, came from which of these three groups? The Essenes. Because the Essenes were the ones who had pulled themselves away from the from from that, that mess of politics. And they, they loved God so much they were willing to kill people for it. So into this stew, Jesus comes. Right? Jesus is born. He grows up. He goes to John and is baptized. He goes out into the wilderness and he's tempted. And when he comes back, he comes back to the area of Galilee. And the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord was on him. And people were amazed because the things he taught sounded different than any of the three groups. There were things that were recognizable, certainly, but at its core... What Jesus was saying was different, and so they were amazed, and they listened. And then one day, he went to Nazareth. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. The most scary thing that you can read in the Bible is everyone praised him generally means that they didn't have a clue. Sounded good, it was different. He was a nice guy. And besides, miracles tended to follow where he went. So we'll praise him. Notice it doesn't say everyone praised God because of him. They're still having trouble with this faith thing. They've made the law their God, whether they're a Sadducee, a Pharisee, or an Essene, or whether you know someone who is part of those, and you know where do your sympathies lie? Very much like political parties today. Very much like that. Everybody talking about one thing or another, and both of them missing the point. Okay. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. So, Jesus comes back to town. We know from, from other historical documents that there is a good chance that Jesus had been educated in a rabbinical school. It's not where he learned about God, because he was God. But he learned all of the things that had to do with Judaism. So he probably had the outfit. Right? He walks into the synagogue in the outfit. By the way, it was the Pharisees who invented, invented the synagogue. They thought everybody should learn the law, not just the elites. Okay. So he walks into a synagogue, is invited to read, he stands up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. That's why we spent time in Isaiah last week, because Jesus was going to use Isaiah this week. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. This is found in Isaiah 61, if you want to look at it. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's verse 1 and just the beginning of verse 2. 
That's where he stopped. Critically important to know that he stopped there because the rest of that prophecy through 61 and into 62 and 63 is all about the ultimate end of things. Jesus starts right at the beginning because he is the beginning of the end. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Because that's what you did. You stood up to read the word of God. You sat down to explain it. Just the opposite of what we do. We tend to sit and read and stand up to explain. But that was the way they did it. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. This is a God thing as far as I'm concerned. You know, um, Jesus reads something. And in their heart of hearts, they know that he is what he's reading. They don't get it, but they sense it. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> what Jesus did right there was the same thing God did with the Israelites. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I am God. There will be no other gods before me. Jesus sits down and says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am. I am. He's declaring who he is and beginning to initiate as the, the Lamb of God what's going to be required through the next three years or so until he takes away the sin of the world and then raises triumphant over death. He makes every bit as strong a statement here as when Isaiah wrote in chapter 6, you know, in the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, exalted high and lifted up. And it was overwhelming to him. Well, it was overwhelming to these people as well. And in their confusion, and in their, are you certain? Did he just say what I think he said? And they start talking amongst themselves, and they realize that he really means this. He is telling them, in effect, I am God. And they start disagreeing amongst themselves, and he finally says, no prophet is, without, is with honor in his own country. And so in response to that, they grabbed him in the synagogue, drug him out of town, and to the edge of the cliff, they were going to throw him off, and he just disappears. Can you imagine being the, the head deacon? It's your job to take this rabble rouser, you know, by the scruff of the neck, and you're hauling him out, you know, you and the, the assistant deacon. And you're, you're, you move him out there, and you get to the edge, and you go, in the name of the Lord God! <laughs> okay, never mind. I mean, wh what do you do? In every sense, this man proves who he is. And they're still scratching their heads. Pretty common, huh? Pretty common. So, what does this have to do with faith? Well, here's the initiative part. And Jesus initiated in many, many other ways, but this was a, a nice dramatic example. He makes a contrast throughout his teaching about little faith... And this word really is the word for little faith. It's the word faith and the word little munged together. And is always talked about, oh, you of little faith. That kind of little faith. And then Jesus also made this contrast, or added the contrast to it, of little faith. Little faith was a good thing. It's been called mustard seed faith through the years. That's little faith versus little faith. He used the, said the same things, but 
differently. I wanted to look at some examples. This is from the, the Sermon on the Mount, and this is the, the first, the negative side of little faith. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? If God is God and God is doing what he has promised to do, in fact, I, I, I get uncomfortable using the word promise with God because it's, it, the word is so loaded with, you know, when I make a promise to my kids, sometimes I can't keep it. Circumstances change. and I, I can't keep it for some reason. Well, God doesn't make a promise that he can't keep. These are statements of fact. So if God has said, I am God, and this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, listen to him, then we're supposed to listen to him. But instead, we try to figure it out. Well, Lord, you know, if I listen to you, things might get tough. I may not have food to eat or clothes to wear. Oh, you of little faith. That's Jesus' words. Oh, you of little faith. If God can't do what he has said he'll do, after all of the things that he's already done that he said he would do, why do we get so wrapped up in, well, Lord, what's going to happen? We love to pick on, on these people because, you know, they were back then. Just like we picked on the people in the Old Testament. We're no different now. Every question that we're ever asked on, on the radio about end times is a fear-based question. Oh, Lord, I'm not going to suffer, am I? And if I suffer, how much? I mean, are they going to take my family? Are they going to take me? Oh, Lord, you've got to come before that. And he says, stop worrying. Don't ask what we'll eat, what we'll drink, what we'll wear. It's a good chance what we'll be eating and drinking and wearing may not be what we're eating and drinking and wearing today, but God's in charge. God is in charge. If God is God, what is faith? Belief that God is God and that he'll follow through. Faith isn't about anything other than a being. Because if it is about anything other than that being, God himself, we will be disappointed. Here's another example. This was after uh, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law and had spent an entire day performing miracles. They're in the boat, and a storm blows up. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. What kind of fisherman doesn't know how to swim? <laughs> Apparently a lot of them. <laughs> you know, I know how to swim and I still don't like boats. But that's, that's my problem. So Jesus wakes up. He replied, you of little faith. They've been watching all day long as Jesus cast out demons and healed the sick and made the blind see and did all of these things that he said today these things are fulfilled in your hearing. And he says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? See how faith and fear are opposites? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. And they were shocked by this. And every day of your life, walking with the very God of the universe who is in human form, and he, I mean, people touched him, and they were healed. And you see that day after day after day, and something like this happens, and you go, oh, my God, they were going to die. And he says, oh, you of little faith. Why are you letting your fear control you? One of our favorite stories, everybody growing up, Peter walking on the water. Oh, 
oh, it's, it's a ghost. No, it's not a ghost. It's Jesus. Well, Jesus, let me come on out there. Well, come on out. Then Peter got down out of the boat. Notice he had to climb down. <laughs> it, it's it's not, not that he stepped onto the water. He had to, boom, he steps down and he didn't sink. Walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, how do you see the wind? He looked at the water. He saw the white caps, the spray in his face, and he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Beginning to sink. Doesn't even say he sank. He gets out there and he thinks God has called him to his death. Says, Lord, save me. <laughs> Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? This is after the feeding of the 5,000. Well, we'd be better. I doubt it. This little story comes after the second time Jesus said, look, you guys want a sign? I'll give you the sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights, I'm going to rise again. I don't get it. Okay, It's after the Jonah statement and before, who do you say that I am? When Peter says, well, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay? So we have Jesus declaring his godness, the fact that the grave cannot hold me. It's followed by, well, who do, who do you say that I am? Oh, you're God. In the middle, he had said, beware of the bread or the yeast of the Pharisees. So they get their heads together and they're discussing this amongst themselves and they say, oh, it's because we didn't bring any bread. We didn't bring any food. He doesn't want us to go buy bread from the Pharisees. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asks, you of little faith, why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? And then he explains that the yeast of the Pharisees is their teaching. And if you hold on to that teaching, it will sprout in you the way, it will ferment in you the way, way yeast ferments and it will ruin your belief system. Whoa, is that what you meant? Well, I thought you didn't want us to go buy bread from the Pharisees. I mean, it's, it's like ships passing in the night. And there they are with him every day. This little story comes after the transfiguration. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Remember, they came down off the mountain of transfiguration and the, there's this kid that's demon-possessed and, you know, they're, they're doing everything. In the name of the Father and the Son. You know, and nothing's happening. You've seen this on TV, right? It's fun to watch. It's scary, though. And, and he says, well, it's because you have so little faith. They're out there yelling and screaming at Satan as if he's going to be afraid of you. Satan could wipe the floor with you. He wouldn't even have to pay attention and wipe the floor with you. What's he saying? I am faith. I am God. I am the one who defeats Satan. Don't get out there on your own and think you can do this. I mean, this should be required reading for anyone who thinks they've been given a deliverance ministry. You better be careful no running around out there trying to beat up Satan. If God's not doing it, it's not getting done. And so Peter, James, and John experience the transfiguration. They come down the mountain and people are having this terrible time and they, you know, Jesus fixes it. And then they're talking amongst themselves again about the transfiguration and, you know, it, 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 there's Jesus, you know, we're going to make booths for him and everything. But then it was gone and so we couldn't. And wow, isn't that amazing? Well, why couldn't we cast out? Do you see the, the juxtaposition of the, the illogic? Jesus is without question God. 
Okay, and we set that on the shelf and we come over here and we say, yeah, but then we were having trouble with this, this demon. Obviously, I'm not God. And that's what he's saying. You have little faith. So let's look at the other little faith. A couple of examples. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Faith as small as a mustard seed. And yet he had just several times said, oh, you folks have just little faith. How little must their faith have been if mustard seed was great enough to move mountains? Well, obviously, it has nothing to do about mustard seed or the size of your faith. It's something about God. Something about God. And he does it again. This is at the fig tree. Jesus replied, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you know, he had to tie the two together. We play the I doubt it game masterfully. And you do it at work, you do it at school, you do it at home, and most of all, we do it with God. You are forgiven. Are you sure? I doubt that. You haven't seen how bad I've been. Why, just yesterday. And we start rehearsing. And God goes, what? If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Everybody focuses on that statement. If you believe, you will receive everything you ask for. Oh, I believe. No, you don't. No, I don't. Right. This is a call to absolute leaving ourselves behind. I don't get to bring Richard along to the party. All I get to do is to come to Jesus. And he does with Richard as he sees fit, transforming me, transforming you. You see? So, Jesus had to add insult to injury. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have, any, have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. You know this story. The centurion comes, his servant is sick, is dying. Jesus says, well, I'll come with you. He says, no, 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 you don't need to come. This is a Roman for crying out loud. What is Jesus' response? He heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. This is a foreigner for crying out loud. A Roman, an uncircumcised pagan. And he says to Jesus, I know exactly who you are. Just speak, that's enough. What did, what did the Pharisees and Sadducees constantly come to Jesus with? Prove it, prove it, prove it. Show me a sign, prove it. This man says, Tom, it's enough that you speak. And he meant it. And his servant was healed. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. This is the woman who lived up in the area of Tyre and Sidon, a Phoenician, another one of those pagans, those people that the Jews hated. They hated a lot of people. I think they hated themselves, actually. And so Jesus, you know, she's got this sick daughter, and Jesus says, well, you know, I, I, I can't help you. You're a pagan. She says, yeah, but, you know, I've heard you're merciful. Well, you know, sometimes there are dogs out there and, and you know, we, we don't mess with dogs. And then she says, yeah, but even dogs get crumbs. What is Jesus' response? And Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. What's the difference between these two pagans and the disciples. I didn't pick on the rest of the Jews. I mean, most of them were in his face all the time. 
I don't care that you just, you know, put that person's leg back on. That's not enough. Show me a sign. Okay, sign of Jonah. For three days, I will raise from the dead. Huh? You see, with, with the Sadducees, Pharisees, and Essenes, and then most of the people following some form of that teaching, tied up completely in the law, there's a problem. What is that problem? They traded a relationship with the law giver for law keeping. Never again will we fall like we did before and, you know, be taken over by foreign countries. Well, except for Greece and Rome. And, you know. But never again. They gave up the relationship with the law giver, which is what he asked for, in order to be law keepers because they thought that would win them points. Another way of saying it is they traded faith for works and lost both faith and works. If ever you try to relate to God on the basis of works to prove your faith, you will disprove both. Both. That's what happened with Israel. We're in this political stew, this religio, religious political stew. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are duking it out for who should be in charge of Jerusalem while the Romans are going. But they're duking it out. The people are duking it out with them and they're paying attention and they, they like one and not the other and they kind of like the Pharisees better because they were nicer. And the Essenes are off down in Masada going, all of you are going to get whacked. What happened to the Essenes down in Masada? They got whacked, starved them out. So they chose suicide instead of subjugation. I mean, what a clash of titans we've got here. People who all love the law. Remember, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law was a preparation to bring these people forward so the Messiah could be born out of Israel. God promised it. God did it. It happened. But because they made an idol of the law... They couldn't see God when he was standing there in front of them. The pagans could. So, fellow Jews, or are we fellow pagans? Which is it? Well, unfortunately, it's a little bit of both, isn't it? There are days when we can stand Nothing, nothing will prevail because God is with us. We are rested completely in him. And then there are days when the lightest breath of a feather blows us down the street. Well, that's because we've got indwelling sin. But at least we have a choice now. You know, in reality... Um, we're too hard on the Jews, both before Jesus and during Jesus, because at either of those times, if God had actually shown himself, things would have been really bad, right? Remember the pictures I showed last week? Uh, we're not talking about the Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. No, we are, we are heirs of what God did for the children of Israel when he said, pay every bit of attention to the God behind the curtain. Because that God is going to do something you would never imagine. And when he did it, Jesus is there in human form. You can't see God in Jesus. There's every once in a while when God would say, let's show them a little bit, and a little bit of God would come out, and people would be healed or fed, or sins would be forgiven, or life would be offered. But yet, if you were standing, you know, if Jesus were sitting here among us, and it was back then, 
we wouldn't, we wouldn't notice him. I mean, Isaiah told us that too, right? He's, he's nothing special. He's, he's just, just a guy. And so believing that Jesus is God required faith. Required taking him at his word rather than saying, are you certain? Jesus said several times, well, at least believe because of the miracles. But the problem with believing because of miracles is that it turns into belief in the miracles. And as soon as we're believing the miracles, then we need more miracles. That's our problem today with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does miraculous things, unimaginable things. And we hear about those things on occasion. We say, whoa. Did you hear what happened over wherever? And pretty soon we're worshiping the miracle. We're giving up a relationship with the life giver, in our case, for a relationship with the law. Because that's the only option. So in reality, the Jews of Jesus' day, and in particular the disciples, had exactly the same problem as Israel did. On the one hand, they and we tend to look to ourselves or external factors for strength. Therefore, we assume we can do it for and by ourselves. On the other hand, we feel that God has abandoned us. Remember the example I gave last, last week? It's, it's a thing that used to bug me to no end. I'd pray the sincerest prayer I had ever prayed in my life. Oh, please, God, help me. And in 23 milliseconds, he hadn't said anything stupendous. And so I said, well, he must have abandoned me. I'm on my own. So we figure we must do it for ourselves, by ourselves. I'll bet you can guess where I'm going next week when we talk about faith in the letters. Paul and John and Peter. Humans haven't changed. Right? We still tend toward disbelief. We still tend toward doing it ourselves. We still tend to believe the lie that Satan told. Oh, God doesn't want you to be like him. Because if, he, if you know the difference between good and evil, then you'll be like God. Oh, by the way, you won't die. Oh, we want both of those. I want to be like God, and I don't want to die. So we buy the lie, and we lose it all. We're no different than the disciples. We're no different than the children of Israel. Some of us have been no different than the worst things they ever did. Some of us are no different than the very best things they ever did. But that doesn't matter if it's not by faith. If it's not done because the Lord God of the universe has overwhelmed me so that I cease choosing me and continuously choose him, that's when faith wakens. Faith is every bit as much a person as grace is. I'll give you a hint for next week. Remember in Galatians when Paul said, before this faith appeared. Before this faith appeared. Jesus appeared. Jesus is faith. Jesus is God. Jesus is grace. Jesus is everything. So we have to put up with the Old Testament and the synoptic gospels, the disciples in particular, in order to see enough of ourselves to stop thinking that either one of these statements is true. We need to hear the bad news so that we get over the fact that we, can need, we can't do things and we mustn't do things. Especially those things that have already been done. It does sound negative. 
because they so thoroughly confuse themselves. But it's not negative because it's just true. Don't judge them. Look for yourself in their stories. Look for yourself when, when the tough times come and, and you say, well, you know, when, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. No, the tough rest. The tough rest. That doesn't mean you won't be busy. Oh, no. Walking by faith, you will, <laughs> you will be called to do things you never imagined. Never, ever. But you're still resting. So don't judge all those people all of our ancestors, look for yourself in them and then look to the God who continuously revealed himself to them and to us and say, thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, you, you showed up. You came to this earth. You declared yourself for who you are. And our ancestors, and us by extension, said, well, maybe, maybe not. We know that we're stiff-necked. We know that we're hard-headed. We know that we rebel at the drop of a hat. But we also know, because of where we are in this earth's history, that you already dealt with our stiff neck and our hard heads. You already dealt with it. You died. You rose again. You made faith personal and real. No, they didn't understand it, and we don't understand it, but that's beside the point. You're still you. As long as we're alive, we will be demonstrated over and over and over again that we fail. But every time we are demonstrated that we fail, we are also demonstrated that you were already victorious. So we thank you for that, and we ask you to remind us as we go through our week to trust you, to believe you, to take you at your word in your name.